Okay. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I think it's high time we start the program. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, I'll be admitting every other person, but I will go ahead to start the program. Okay, thank you. you can go ahead. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us today. We are really grateful and want to show a really big appreciation to our speaker. He's been early. He joined us for more than 20 minutes now before the start of the program. So we are really grateful for that. We we, we appreciate your punctuality and um, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. So without taking much of our time, I'm going to go through the agenda for today. So I'll go off the camera a little bit. Okay. So, um, Today, we're going to be looking at interactive uh, maps in Shiny dashboard using the leaflet package. So, so our agenda for today, we're welcoming all participants and we're really appreciative of all your efforts to join our webinars every time. So we'll, we, we appreciate that. We really thank you so much for that. So then also we have um, the Abuja R user group. This is co-organized by people who are really passionate about R. We use R in our daily work. And we're, we're so, so, so um, passionate in sharing the knowledge and building a community within our society. So um, we look forward to doing so much to empower ourselves, both in the academic um, world and also in our professional um, endeavors. So. With this, this part of the things we'll give back to the community, organizing webinars and um, out get, going through outreach to uh, schools within our society. That's our little community here, although we are the capital of the country, but we are doing as much as possible to reach out to all the institutions within Abuja. And we're still looking forward to getting more people to know and also use R in their daily work. So I'm Billy Kisu uh, Olatunji. So I'm the founder and co-organizer of the program of the R user group here in Abuja. And I'm co-organizing the group with Stephen Balogun Fidelis. And we also have Danladi Adam. So we really work together to do as much as possible with the support of our members to give a lot in sharing knowledge to the community. So that's a little brief about us. So I'm going over now to introduce our speaker for today. So I'm, I'm going to really please apologize if I don't pronounce your name well, but I'll try my best to do justice to that. So um, our speaker today is Janice Wani Arashi. Okay, good. Okay, he is an R Shiny developer with Absalon. So he graduated from the University of Sir um, Jaiwa. <laughs> Sorry, please, you have to help me with that when you introduce uh yourself. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Uh, it's uh, University of Sri Jayawardenepura. So um, okay, good. In Sri Lanka. <laughs> yeah, in Sri Lanka. I'll, I'll that up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So he graduated with a first class honors in statistics, and his main research interests are focused on data visualization, statistical modeling, and time series forecasting. He currently maintains and authored four R packages, including Qatar, DS Job Tracker, and Nick. In his free time, he mostly work on creative writing, generative arts, and practicing Mohai Sai. I hope I get that right. 
So I want to welcome to our community, Janice. Thank you so much for joining us. So it's time for you to take us through the session. Thank you so much for inviting me to your community as well. So um, I will need, um, yeah, okay, I'll start sharing my screen now. All right, okay. So um, the topic today will be interactive maps in China dashboard using the leaflet package. And uh, if you want to follow along uh, with these slides, uh, these slides are available here and uh, I can drop it into the chat here as well um, for all of you to check out. And uh, right, I think, yeah, that should work. Right, okay. So um, without further ado, I will give a, so uh, already you have heard a good introduction about myself. So as mentioned earlier, I'm an r shiny developer. Uh, with the honors degree in statistics from University of Shijaradhanapura and I've authored several R packages, but that's something you already know. But to give to give a bit of an insight about how I came into R and R Shiny, well, it started out with, uh, I actually got into R earlier before working in R, I worked in Python and C++. And uh, from a computer science background, I came into statistics uh, to work on Shiny through, uh, to a request for help from a fellow colleague uh, on the making a dashboard for uh, Taekwondo games. Taekwondo is a martial art. So uh, for Taekwondo matches, they want to record the data that happens within the matches. So uh, for that, I started learning about R and Chinese all together through that. So it's been quite a lot long journey now and uh, it's uh, a slow learning curve, but I think everyone here will learn a lot today. So uh, let's meet uh, a friend of ours. So meet Dio. Dio is a noise uh, bird watcher in Nigeria. So he has gone to different places to observe birds. And uh, he has a lot of friends overseas that who are coming into Nigeria to experience the wildlife. And he wants to share with them a sort of a website or a dashboard where they can uh, explore the uh, landscape of of Nigeria and see where the bird or the watching sites are. So if they come for a tour, they can easily understand where they want to go for. Um, Dio knows a little bit of basic on data wrangling and sorts, but he uh, also knows a little bit on web development using R and Shiny, the basic stuff, but he wants to go further from there. And also he has a small problem. Now, when we go out on a trip, we really don't, even though we uh, are normally data scientists and so on, so on we normally don't uh, think to record the data that we are, we are going with. And uh, in this case also, Dio has not exactly recorded. I went to this place and I saw these, these birds on these, these times. So he will have to resort to finding some data online. Now, uh, luckily for him, there is a data set on uh, bird observations taken from the Nigeria Bird Atlas Project, uh, which is available on GBIF, which is the Global uh, Biodiversity Information Facility. And uh, so he had, uh, he just had to go to the GBIF site, create an account, and then download the data set. After downloading the data set, uh, Dio cleaned it out using Tidyverse and the basic data wrangling uh, that he knows to uh, remove some of the columns and then uh, uh, summarize everything into one place. Now, with the data ready with him, he needs to get an idea about how he's going to make this dashboard. Now, he needs to get an idea, okay, uh, when, when we are getting into a web development or web application development process, the first thing uh, that we need to understand is uh, what are the features, what are the use cases that the uh, end user might be using? Like, uh, for example, um, will it be necessary for them to see uh, what are the birds that were observed in 1999. That's not going to be that much useful for them. Um, and uh, it might be useful as a small trivia, but apart from that, they just want the most recent data. And like that, we need to think about what sort of uh, functionalities does the end user want. And in this case, what Dio decided to sketch out was, so this is the final dashboard that he had in mind. And 
what he had in mind was to have a small uh, date uh, a date selector where he can say let's say one of his friends are going to be staying uh, during the month of september to uh, October. So he wants to see, uh, so he would only be uh, wanting to see the birds that were sighted during that time. And uh, for that, he can uh, use this date rain slider. So he wants to have a date rain slider that will uh, automatically showcase only the birds that were seen during that time. And apart from that, also, there might be people who are looking for specific birds. So he needs a small, uh, small search bar here, uh, a search bar here where he can enter the scientific name. Here, there's a bit of a uh, disconnect because the data set currently has only the scientific names. And uh, it is possible for him to scrape out uh, a website to get the original, uh, the, the Nigerian name, the English name, and the vernacular names. But that would require a bit of an effort. And he wanted to get this out as soon as possible so that he can improve upon it. So as a basic st uh, starting point, so when we are starting out on a project, it's best to have a smaller, simpler version of, uh, of what we want to do so that we know if we can reach this, then it's a small step from there to go to this level. And even if we make halfway through uh, to getting from the basic step to the advanced step, we have come a long way to have a basic implementation with ourselves as well. So apart from searching, so when they search a, a scientific name, let's say uh, Trudus Pelios, when they type that name out, they want to see only the markers and the areas where the bird was sighted the most. And uh, also, he wants to see, uh, let's say someone is uh, staying towards uh, Zuru uh, or, uh, sorry, uh, staying more towards uh, Zaria or Abuja. If they're staying in that area, he wants to let the user see uh, what are the uh, species that are most common for that area. So uh, that is where he uh, has decided to use this bar chart with a, a table as well, so that people can see, okay, this bird is more popular in these areas where I'm staying. And uh, in addition, he also wants to add a small feature where when someone clicks on a bird watching site, he can see what are the most popular birds that, are, uh, that were seen there. So based on the overall proper popularity, what are the most popular birds that are seen in that site? So these are the separate functionalities that he wants to see. And he can also add in um, a functionality to showcase what are the hotspots for birds, where a lot of birds were sighted within that uh, place so that they can go to that site specifically and then find out what are the places best for that. So here are the ones with the red colors and the ones with the uh, purple colors, those are with higher number of observations. So all of these now, at first, it might seem a bit daunting and you might be having way larger set of ideas, but it's best to have a basic wireframe of, okay, this is what I'm going to be developing. Let's start out with small, small pieces of uh, these uh, um, components. Now, he's going to be, Dio is going to be built in this on Shiny, right? So he wants to go back to Shiny and refresh himself up on Shiny. And uh, for that, he goes through this amazing book called Mastering Shiny. So if, if any one of you wants to get a refresher on Shiny, get back to, uh, get, uh, get back to your uh, feet on Shiny and learn the basics uh, from the basics to the advanced levels, Mastering Shiny is a really good book. And uh, so to give a basic uh, introduction to Shiny, uh, Shiny is a framework for creating web applications using R code. So a web application could be, uh, it could be a website and uh, a website or a dashboard or any other thing and uh, any other service or an application that is that directly inter uh, interacts with the internet through, uh, the, through the end user through a browser. And Shiny helps us write web applications using R code. Now, in any other case, normally what we have seen is that um, yes, uh, normally what we have seen is that uh, we would be using JavaScript or uh, TypeScript or some sort of uh, other languages that are out there, maybe Go even, to uh, write servers and front-end servers. And there's a lot of full stack developers. There's a lot of terminology that is there. Uh, Shiny was built forward to simplify all of that and make it easier for anyone who's a data scientist who's worked with R and who has 
generated a set of uh, insights from his data to share that with everyone else. And uh, there are two components to a shiny application, the user interface and the business logic. So uh, the user interface and the server. The server contains the business logic. So what we mean by the business logic here is basically it connects the input and the output and how the, in, uh, the output reacts to the input. And this is done through something called reactive programming. And you can read a lot more about it on the Master Shiny book as well. But if I give a small idea about what happens here, so this is the structure of a Shiny application. So you have, uh, we first call library Shiny and you have the UI and the server. The server is a function and it takes the input, output and the session. And uh, the UI can contain a fluid page. This is, these are functions given by Shiny. A fluid page is just a web page that we are saying, I want a web page as my uh, UI. And there we are saying uh, we need uh, to have a text input here, which uh, asks uh, asks the end user to uh, tell what's your name. And when the name is given, it'll be stored in uh, this variable called name. Uh, technically, it's a part of a bigger variable, but uh, we define these inputs and outputs like this. And we, we say there should also be an output that gives out a text. Uh, with the name greeting. So we give these labels to these inputs and outputs so that we can identify, okay, this is the input and this is the output that it's connected to. And what reactive programming does is that once you have defined these two pieces, we then say if the input, uh, if the if the name in the input changes, then uh, the input with the label name, if it changes, then uh, render a text, render meaning that generate a new text with this uh, expression where we insert, uh, where we paste the uh, text hello and the exclamation mark at the end and set assign that to the greeting. So uh, what happens in reactive programming is when the uh, server starts, first it will uh, 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 set up a blank slate where the output and the input is all set into a blank level, a null level. And once the user has typed something into the text box, the text input, uh, immediately this part becomes invalidated. And once, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, this part becomes invalidated. Once that has become invalidated, then all of the uh, ones that have been connected to it will also be, be uh, start to recalculate as well. And as you can see here now, uh, I typed in Janet and this ha has started to calculate and this is still calculating. So once we have a small change in the input the output reacts along to it so it's uh, that is where uh, that is where one way to re uh, memorize what the reactive programming programming does once uh, when the input changes the output reacts accordingly so that is a bit of an idea about what shiny and reactivity is the reason why this is going to be important is when leaflet uh, works with uh, maps there will be pieces where we'll be working with reactive programming where we want to react to the uh, different actions of uh, within the map. It could be uh, clicking on a map, it could be zooming into the map, or it could be just uh, selecting some areas, changing the uh, different uh, points that we are showing. So many more. So with that being said, now we want to show a map. Well, what's the best way to show it? Show a map? The best way is to make it interactive. So you might remember this uh, earlier, uh, recently uh, this incident happened maybe within the Chicago uh, News Network as well. The weatherman suddenly realized that uh, that the uh, the map with behind him, it has a touch screen on it and it is interactive as well. So everyone was shocked and everyone was really happy about it. And this video became so viral as well. And um, it actually captures the idea that we had as well when we first had our smartphones as well, and we could zoom in and pan out and tilt uh, within uh, images and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, with interactive maps, it's uh, much better for us to get a clear idea and zoom in and uh, interact with the data to generate insights of our own. And uh, to do that, this is where Leaflet comes into play. Now, uh, Leaflet is actually a JavaScript uh, uh, language. Uh, so a JavaScript package and the R leaflet R package is a wrapper around the JavaScript package, uh, JavaScript library to provide us with the uh, functionalities to work with the leaflet JavaScript library through R code. And to start using it, you just need to call install.packages 
and you can install leaflet uh, straight away with no other languages needed to be installed other than R. And the starting point of the uh, leaflet map is the function leaflet. So uh, this leaflet uh, function returns a simple leaflet map widget, which can be updated later on. And here you can set on different uh, options, settings for the map. You can say that the user can only zoom in up to this level and the user can only zoom out up to this level. You can set restrictions like that. And we can also change the rendering engine that is used. So here, uh, there are two options to choose from, the SVG and the canvas. So uh, this is a small tip if you are going to be using uh, leaflet in the production level, since uh, from what I've heard, most of you here are working and using R in your daily, daily uh, work as well. So uh, in production levels, it's uh, if there's a lot of markers, if there's a lot of points you are going to be visualizing, it's best if you can use the uh, canvas and uh, instead of SVG uh, rendering engine. So you can set that using prefer canvas equals true here. And uh, now if you just run the leaflet map, it just doesn't show anything meaningful, it just show a blank screen. And uh, to add actual uh, views of the world, we need to add tiles on top of it. And what Dio wants to show case is his home uh, country. So he decides to uh, showcase Nigeria. Now, uh, when we add tiles at first, we are what we are getting is tiles that are defined by the open, uh, Open map, uh, open map streets uh, uh, contributors. And uh, once we add those tiles, we can uh, then say, uh, when we first add those tiles, we will see the entire world map on it. But if you want to focus our map onto a, a specific bound, we can give the latitude and the longitude of the two farthest edges. And uh, these are the uh, points that I want the map to be limited to. So to give a bit of a refresh on what latitudes and longitudes are. So uh, latitudes are the values on the x-axis. The longitude are the values on the y-axis. And here for Nigeria, you can simply just Google it and uh, see what, what sort of a range uh, Nigeria falls under with terms to latitude and longitude. And uh, once I decided on that, you can simply set these are the boundaries that I want and it will automatically set up in this way. Now here, uh, leaflet you can run leaflet in the r console and see the output in the viewer so this is currently not still in the shiny applications we are just running it within the console and seeing how it goes and uh, now uh, apart from those uh, the open street map contributors uh, tiles we can even add different tiles according to the style and the coloring and the uh, details that we want to show so here i have used the uh, add provider tiles function to use the s3 nat geo world map and uh, there are different limitations and different uh, uh, advantages of different ones so here you can see a bit of the terrain and the uh, naming and the fonts are different as well and there are some limitations where uh, in this one if you zoom in too much uh, it will start saying that the map data is not available so there are limitations to the zoom level as well in some of these and uh, but overall you can go through and try on each one of them and see how they uh, react to each other and uh, with that being said now that dio knows how to add tiles dio wants to first try out by first let's just uh, plot one point and uh, to begin things with he decides to plot the map of abuja and uh, for that he had he just needs to call this function add markers so first you get the leaflet base map you add tiles on top of it to uh, uh, plot out the world map and then you add the marker this is where i want the marker to be on the latitude and the longitude and here i also have called this function set view uh, this is technically not needed uh, in normal cases but i have put it here so that the the latitude and the longitude will be at the center of the map just for demonstration purposes. So if you want your map to be centered on a specific latitude and longitude, you can set the lat and long like this and set the zoom level accordingly. Right, um, so now that Dio can put in these markers, he takes in the data, the data set that he has cleaned earlier, puts it inside uh, alongside with leaflet and he straight away plots it in and it's quite a lot of markers. And that's quite a lot of markers there. And this is after putting up a sample only. The entire data set when he puts up the map doesn't even come up it takes a long time to load and it looks really noisy as well so uh he uh, dio can also try and uh, 
cluster these markers by specific specifying the cluster options here. So when using a data set, when we are using a data set to define the uh, latitude and the longitude of several markers, you can use this formula notation. So let's say this DEF has a column called decimal latitude and the decimal longitude. So it has two columns, the latitude and the longitude. So if I want the latitude to be uh, given by a specific column, let's say uh, LAT, then I need to add this tilde sign and say LAT uh, for the lat argument and for the LNG argument, I just have to put tilde sign and the specific longitude, uh, the column containing the longitude values. And uh, for this marker cluster options, now see you can hover over this and see different polygons that uh, pertain to the clustering area. So you can uh, even change whether the uh, the color of these uh, highlighting uh, boundaries and whether uh, they should be seen at all times, uh, not not just on hover. And uh, when you zoom in, you can actually see different levels of uh, clustering as well. And if you zoom in even further, you can break it into even smaller pieces like this. It's quite quite nice what you can do with this. And uh, this is really helpful if you have a lot of points that you want to cluster together and showcase it to someone. And also, since the uh, points are colored by the frequencies, if they can see where the highest number of concentrated number of markers are there. So here, this is naturally having a higher number of markers here. And uh, yeah, so moving forward from there, uh, Dio was not sure because every time that he uh, points a mark, uh, he uh, showcases a point in the map, it showcases uh, this marker with a small balloon on top. He wanted to see whether he can put a circle in there instead. So that can be done using add circles. And uh, the same notation applies here as well. You set the, lat, uh, the latitude uh, with the formula notation, the longitude with the formula notation, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, uh, yeah, so apart from that, uh, there's also the option of uh, adding uh, circles and circle markers. So you can add the uh, circles and the circle markers. So the difference between these two is that the uh, circles have this radius specified in meters, while circle markers are specified in pixels. So if you have, uh, let's say you are plotting, um, plotting the movement of some set of species on a land, and you have an idea about how uncertain you are in meters of that precise location, let's say you're using a GPS tracker, and the GPS tracker can tell how uncertain it is of you can uh, get an idea about the measurement error variance. So if there's an uncertainty around that measurement, you can uh, plot that as well with using the uh, circles, uh, the add circles function. And when the radius is specified in meters, and if you uh, want your circle markers to scale with the uh, zoom level, you can use the uh, add circles option at circle markers option to specify the radius in pixels so that the uh, scale uh, changes with the zoom level. So if I zoom in here, you can see that the radius of the uh, pixel changes. So here, what I have used is at circles and I've used uh, straight away the uh, radius to be uh, set by um, the count of the species. And uh, there's an argument there where you can use it to set the uh, radius like that. From there onwards, uh, you can also for uh, each and specific uh, marker that you have put. So if say now, now uh, this is one part of the uh, final dashboard we were going to build. We wanted to showcase when a person clicks on it, uh, the number of uh, the different species that were seen there. Suppose we wanted to also add the option of when someone clicks on it to showcase the number of birds that were seen there. So uh, a pop-up normally works when we click on a marker while uh, a label works when we uh, hover over the marker. So labels can be a bit hard to tackle with because of the random placing and uh, different sizes of the marker. And uh, as you can see here, the label can be off put in some places because of the uh, placement of the map. Um, unless your map is uh, not cornered uh, like this in a smaller window, uh, you can use labels, but if it's in a smaller window like this, it's best to be cautioned about uh, where the labels are going to pop up. 
The pop-ups, uh, on the other hand, are quite easy to work with. And there you just have to uh, put the class uh, form, uh, sorry, the formula notation and uh, use the uh, HTML escape function to make sure that uh, there aren't any, um, there aren't any pieces, uh, there aren't any text in your string that could be interpreted as HTML. This is just for sanity purposes and just for safety. It's not really necessary and you can simply uh, uh, avoid this part as well, but it's for safety reasons, it's best to use it as well. And here I have specified these, uh, the species count birds were spotted here. And uh, that is exactly what's been uh, shown here as well. Right, now we have identified, okay, these are the different features of uh, leaflet and that is without any, uh, you, we, we aren't getting any user input here. We are simply, the only user input we are getting is the click on their marker and showcasing a pop-up and a label and then um, different reactions to the Zoom level. Now, if we are moving this to Shiny, there are several different things to do. So here I have loaded the data set using the arrow package and the parquet uh, <clears throat> file format. And uh, now earlier we talked about how the UI and the server have two com uh, are the two components of a Shiny application. Here, the same uh, idea follows. So here we'll be having uh, a bootstrap page instead of a fluid page. Uh, that is just a preference of mine. I wanted to work with the bootstrap page. And uh, I have set the body to have a width and height of 100% so that the map can take up the entire space of the uh, screen. And once I've done that, I put the label, the, I mark, I put an ID on the uh, leaflet map as map. So here I say this uh, in the UI, there should be a leaflet map coming up here as the output. And here I put the uh, input as render, uh, sorry, uh, here I assign that uh, the, assign a leaflet map to that output by calling render leaflet. And for that, I pass in the data frame that I read from here and I filter it to the year 2020, uh, to, uh, 2021. So when we do that, we have the data that is most recent. So since 2022 still hasn't uh, completed, it's best to use the data from 2021 as a approximate enough uh, uh, representation of the bird sightings. And once you have selected that data, we can pass the data and add the tiles, add the markers. And since uh, I haven't mentioned the uh, argument name here, uh, but it's best if you can add it as well, but I wanted to keep this simple as much as possible. And that's why I've uh, removed the uh, argument names here but uh, you can specify the longitude and the latitude and that will give you the, uh, the you, that will give you the leaflet map within the shiny dashboard. But here um, afterwards, now let's say we want to add the uh, date range selector. So now uh, in addition to the leaflet output, we are also putting up an absolute panel, an absolute panel. Uh, so this is more towards the CSS side. Uh, there are two different types of positioning, relative and absolute, and uh, yeah, relative and absolute. Those are the two main ones that have been that are being used frequently. And an absolute positioning means that within the window of the uh, win uh, within the window of the screen, you position your uh, element, whatever the element that you are using, absolutely on that specific uh, place with regards to the screen. So if I say bottom ten and right ten, uh, ten pixels from the bottom, ten pixels. Uh, from the right, I will be having the absolute panel there. And uh, once I have that given there, uh, within that panel, I will be putting up a slider input where I'll be saying uh, the, the label of it will be day month. You can select a day of year and the uh, I'll be setting the minimum and the maximum as uh, January 1st and the uh, December 31st. Uh, to get a range of values for a slider, you have to define two values for this uh, value argument. Once you do that, there'll be two, uh, there'll be a slide range instead of one uh, slider going here and there. And once that is done, what we can do is we can define a reactive value. A reactive value is a variable that changes according to the inputs. So earlier we had outputs that change according to uh, inputs. Now we are having inputs uh, variables that change according to uh, input uh, values. And those variables will, use be, will be used within 
outputs as well. So there's a chain reaction. So when a uh, input changes, it updates all of the variables that are connected to it, and in turn updates all of the outputs that are connected to it as well. So here we are defining a reactive variable that takes in uh, <clears throat> that takes in the uh, species sites that uh, sites we have seen uh, the species that were cited within the day and the month of what we wanted. And once we have defined that reactive value, we said that here in the leaflet, uh, we set that as the data frame for the leaflet. We add the markers and add the tiles. And from there onwards, uh, we can update it. And as you can see here, when we move this slider, this entire map gets refreshed. There's a small glitch where this entire map is being refreshed with uh, this entire map being redrawn. Now, that is a bit of a problem. And that takes up a lot of uh, computation time as well. Um, yes, the, uh, there was a question on the chat. Uh, the material and the data will be made available. Uh, I'll be sharing the Shiny application and the source code for it as well. So um, <clears throat> as I was saying, so uh, this currently what we have, what it does is it redraws the entire map at each time that the input changes. So as we said earlier, when the input changes, the variable changes and then from there on the leaflet output changes. But when the leaflet output changes, what happens is that the entire map gets redrawn. We redraw the entire map and say, uh, when uh, when the input changes, this data reactive changes and the data reactive makes us redraw this entire leaflet with the new tiles and the markers, which is not exactly what we want because we know that the tiles are going to be uh, limited. Like we, are, we know that it's going to be static. So what we do is we initially develop something called the leaflet, uh, we, we initially develop the leaflet map by put, calling leaflet, adding the tiles and then fitting the boundaries. And then from there onwards, we use a function called uh, leaflet proxy, which divides the base map and the reactive components. So in the re uh, leaflet proxy, this works at, in the similar way to this, in the leaflet function, where we say, this is the ID of the leaflet map that we want to have a proxy for. So this one we have already defined here. And if you go back here, you can see that we have already defined it as here, the ID of the map. And once you have done that, we can define, okay, this is the data and it can be reactive. And this data will be used uh, for this map. So whenever the uh, this variable changes, only the proxy will be updating. And from there onwards, what we do is we clear any markers that are already there so that we have a clean slate. And from there onwards, we add on top of that, the new markers. This increases the performance and uh, and the smoothness of the application. So this is something that you will want to take uh, note when you are using this for uh, a production level application. Right, so now we initially had an idea about having different components within the, the Shiny application. So um, the day train slider, it's done now. And we have it used up to a certain level. From there onwards, uh, let's move into uh, the uh, problem of finding the popular birds around an area. So when we zoom in to a specific area in the map, we want to see the popular birds in that area. Right, for that, um, what we what Dio can use is uh, something called uh, map events. So if you want to uh, get the, uh, <clears throat> you if you want to get the, uh, the bounds of the current map, like when a uh, user zooms in, if you want to get the latitude and the longitude of the current area that the user is looking at, you can use this uh, input variable called input dollar sign map ID. Here the map ID means the uh, ID that we gave to the leaflet map. So in our case, it's simply map. So here uh, map underscore bounds will give you the latitude and the longitude bounds of the currently visible area. So here, I define a new reactive uh, variable where uh, it's uh, where I first check if the uh, map bounds are null. This is just uh, for safety reasons. From there onwards, I get the map bounds. So here, this gives uh, I just have to call input dollar sign map bounds, and it gives me the bounds. And from there, I can call on the latitude and the longitude by accessing the north, south, east, and west. Uh, values of each of those uh, <clears throat> uh, boundaries of the map. 
And once I've done that, I can simply um, get the uh, get the set of observations that are within the data frame, which are within that latitude and uh, longitude uh, region. Yeah. Uh, once that is done, what I need to do is I need to uh, use that to uh, render a table uh, which uses this reactive value. And then I do some data wrangling to showcase only the top 10 most popular ones there. So what happens here is if I zoom in, if you look at, if you look closer at these numbers, these numbers change according to where I zoom in. So here it's 10, 78, 356, and so on and so forth. So it automatically understands, okay, this is the bound. What are the number of species that are within that bound and automatically updates that table according. Now, that was the second feature that we wanted to fix. And now we come to the third feature that we wanted to fix, which was getting the list of species uh, in a site. So when we click on a marker, we want to get the list of species that were in that uh, area. So Dio can use for that uh, something co uh, called the input uh, map marker click. So basically this has three parts to it. Earlier, what we had was input, uh, input dollar sign map ID, and then underscore bounds. So all the time when we want to get the map bounds, we use the map ID and the underscore and bounds. Here, what we use is input dollar sign, the map ID and the object that we want to access the events for. Here, it's a marker. If it's a circle, if it's a shape, it's something else. But here, what we want is marker. So we call marker and then the event that we want. So here it's a click event. So there are different events. You can read about it in the documentation as well. Once you get that, uh, object, once you get that input object, you can access the ID of uh, that uh, input. So what we are doing now is for each and every marker, we are giving a certain ID. We are telling, okay, your tag is this, this is your tag. So we have an ID for each of these markers so that when we click on one of these markers, we know, okay, this is exactly the marker that I click. So if I clicked on the uh, marker with the number 2017567, I know when I click on it, Shiny will give me the number. Okay, you clicked on this marker. The, this marker had an ID called 2017567. So you can define these IDs by using the layer ID argument when we are adding markers. Again, remember these are all added to the leaflet proxy because we don't want the map to be refreshing and redrawing the entire tiles from scratch. So we add the, uh, we first clear out any markers, we clear out, clear out any clusters, and then we add on the uh, markers for that we say this is the longitude, this is the latitude, and these are the IDs for each of these layers. So you can have IDs that are meaningful to you, or even it could be something that you come up with arbitrarily as uh, one to the number of rows. Once you have those IDs, you can use those IDs to select out which marker was clicked, and from those, from that observation, you can select out these are the uh, values that I want to use. Once that has been once that has been done, um, it seems there's a small error. Yes, uh, okay. So when you click on this marker, it will automatically showcase what are the different uh, animal uh, species that were observed. So if you click on this, it updates automatically what are the different species that were there. So this works by getting the ID from the marker, and then we use that ID to generate uh, to extract the observation for, for that specific marker. And then we can display any information regarding that marker through that event. All right. I think with that, we have covered up the three main points. So if we go back to the uh, plan that we had earlier. <clears throat> so this is the plan that we had. We learned how to uh, use the data insider. Uh, first of all, we learned on how to write, draw this entire leaflet map. We learned how to add different uh, markers. We learned how to cluster each of these markers together. And we also learned how to put circle markers and change their radius and their color. Uh, so you can change those uh, values as well within circle markers. And uh, you can also change the color of these markers as well. You can change the icons for these markers as well. There's a lot of customization uh, capabilities out there, which I won't be able to cover within one hour. And uh, so we covered the data range slider. So the data range slider, it worked by simply getting an input from the uh, slide range, uh, slide slider input, and then using that to update the uh, 
the markers that are put on the map using leaflet proxy. And after that, we want to do at the piece where we want to do uh, showcase a table where the number of most of those species are shown with regards to the map boundaries. For that, we use the map events as well. Now for the search bar, it's a simple matter of, uh, it's a sim similar to what we did with the data in slide as well. So it's simply you search, uh, you type in the name and then you have to check within the uh, list of available uh, scientific names. And uh, when the user gives a value that is similar to it, we can simply uh, use it straight away. <clears throat> and after that, we also learned about how to uh, get the most popular birds within a site by clicking on it using uh, marker click events. And with that, we have come to the end. So when we finish, when we are finishing things up, uh, Dio is ready to put his site out for his friends overseas. He will first receive some uh, feedback and commentary on it. And there will be some uh, critiques where, um, where they will tell these, there are these bugs here, there are these issues here. Uh, it's all right to have these sort of issues at hand. It will be disheartening because you will be putting out a lot of your heart and soul into this. And when you put it, uh, when you may, uh, give it to someone else, and they show out all of the flaws within it, it can be disheartening, but know that they are doing it uh, for you to improve and take, uh, try to make it into a learning experience as well. And the easiest way to uh, host a Shiny application is to use Shiny Apps to tie you. You just need to create a, uh, create an account on Shiny Apps to tie you. The free tier will give you reasonable amount of uh, execution time. And uh, once you've created an account, you have to uh, connect it with the R Studio that uh, application you are using. Once you have connected it, uh, connected it, you can publish your Shiny app simply from R Studio itself by using uh, clicking on the blue uh, publish icon. And with that, it'll be quite easy to uh, publish a Shiny app. And from there onwards, uh, Dio can even add more features into this. So. That is what's different between a data analysis and a, a software um, a software application like a software application like a web application, because in a data analysis we might come to an insight and we decide okay that's the insight we want and that's the conclusion we want. But in a web application there will certainly be improvements to be made every single time. And here uh, Dio can even use the GBIF API, which has uh, which gives you the access to uh, get images and the common names of the bird based on the ID of the bird. So the ID or the scientific name of the bird. So because of that, he can uh, download images. So when someone goes into uh, a specific site and wants to see the different birds that are there, he can see all of the images of the birds that can be seen from there. So they know what sort of birds to expect from there. And you can also use the Google Maps API to show nearby places to stay. And that would be really helpful as well. Suppose someone is looking for a tourist Pelios bird and he wants to, he finds it in a certain site, but he wants to know the closest place he can stay. And if we use the Google Maps API, we can showcase, okay, this is the most closest place you can find uh, to stay here. So um, the GitHub source code is also uh, available here. You can uh, check it out as well. The Finnish Shiny application is live in janitwani.shinyapps.io as well. Um, let's take a small work around uh, the uh, final Shiny application. So here is the application that I've built. And uh, so far I can um, zoom in and the um, different, uh, the, uh, the counts here change as well. And uh, I have also said, click on a marker to see the list of birds over ordered by overall popularity. So if I click on here, I can see the most popular bird species found at this coordinate in the month of June are these uh, bird species. Here, it will be these species like so on and so forth. So every time I zoom out and zoom in, you can see that these values are changing as well. And if I change the date to see only the birds that are within, um, the month of November, September and October. Um, yeah, so I can see these are the ones that are available. So if I'm coming over here, so I can go to, uh, if I'm coming over to Abuja, uh, these are the ones that are available. So here, these uh, Tudor's Pelius is also a common bird, uh, 55 observations. And if I click here, seems like there are a lot of birds here as well, um, which were observed within the month of October. 
and these ones are were uh, observed within the month of September. So this is a definitely a place uh, I would check out as well. And you can uh, search here as well. So if I want to search for um, um, yeah, uh, a bird like this, the Lanius is Berlinus. And if I search out, I should be able to see where this bird is seen. It seems this bird is not seen here. So uh, let's take someone we know already. Let's take the Tudor's Pelios bird. So this is a quite common bird. And you can see that these bird is available here and here and here. And uh, if you look for something else like uh, the Passa grisus bird, you can also see that this bird is also available in different places like this as well. And that is how you would make something like this. And uh, once you have done this, you can also reset this entire thing to bring you to this level. And uh, yeah, so with that being said, uh, I believe uh, you learned quite a lot and I took nearly an hour, I believe. Um, so if you have any more further questions on how, uh, if you have any further questions with our shiny, if there are any bugs in my code, if there are any feedback that you want to give, you can reach out to me on email, Twitter, check out my GitHub or reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. And uh, with that, uh, I think I, I'll wrap up this session and uh, over to you guys. Okay. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful session. And I think we've gotten so much information from you today. So um, I can see a lot of thank yous in the chat. So we're really grateful. This is a really interesting and insightful session. Thank you so much. So I don't know if we have questions. This is the time for us to have the Q&A session. So if you have any questions for Janice, please kindly put it in the chat box or you can signify so that I will allow you to speak. In the meantime, I've added okay. the slides and the uh, GitHub source code as well, if anyone wants it. Okay. So um, I got a question on the chat. That, okay, the materials was also going to share it on our social media handle. So the video is going to be on our YouTube channel and um, the slides all are going to be shared. So, okay. Okay, Um, a question here for you, Janice. Does mm -hmm. the book on Mastering Shiny also provide information on using Livlet in Shiny? Um, not exactly. Uh, the Mastering Shiny book mainly works on giving an idea about the best practices for developing Shiny applications. For uh, info on using Livlet in Shiny, within the Livlet documentation, there's a separate section for Shiny integration where they explain all the uh, pieces and components that you want to consider uh, when you are integrating uh, your leaflet map into Shiny. And uh, let me share that link here as well. So if you want to learn more about using leaflet in um, Shiny, uh, then you can use this link that I've given on the rstudiogitab.io site. Mastering Shiny is good if you want to get an overall idea about Shiny, be it, be, if it's even for leaflet or if any of it's for something else like an e-commerce platform uh, or any other sort of uh, dashboarding uh, requirement as well. I hope that answered the question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Any other question? Okay. Thank you, everybody. So we're getting a lot of thank you there. So... <laughs> So it's a, this session was actually clear and illustrative and the explanation was really spot on. So thank you, yeah. Gustavo. Thank you. Okay. So do we have any question? So, okay, that's a, that's a, so far away that, so Gustavo is from Mexico. So thank mm -hmm. you for joining us. <laughs> thank you. 
Oh, we have somebody from Spain as well. Chris, thank you. So that was a good one there. So it said your presentation was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think um, we've done a good job there. So we don't have <laughs> questions now. Yeah. We don't have for you. Okay, Stephen, would you like to? Okay. Oh, okay. Some rates from India as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Good evening, my question. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. There's a okay, question. So there's a question here. Yeah. Uh, so what was the re Um, okay, should I read the question? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, please do. Please do. Yes. Okay, okay. So the question states what was the React log underscore enable function for? Um, <clears throat> right, so uh, that's a good observation. So uh, the React log fun uh, package is a really good package if you are working with Chinese applications and if you find out that your outputs are not. Uh, reacting properly to your inputs, and if there are any uh, disconnections or if there are issues with uh, with your shiny applications, you can use the fun uh, package React log and enable React log using the React log enable function to generate a reactive graph that shows you the outputs and how the inputs are connected to the input. So. Um, Remember that I, when I was first talking about the uh, input with the name and the greeting, I showed you a small uh, illustration of uh, green uh, shapes and yellow shapes. So that is exactly a screenshot from the React log, uh, uh, the React log output. So when you call a React log enable within your Shiny application, you can simply click uh, Control and F3 on Windows and on a Mac Control and the function key and F3 to uh, go uh, open up a pop-up where it shows us the entire execution of the Shine application with how the inputs are updating to each other. So you can see if there are any issues there as well. <clears throat> right, um, there's a question on when do we use observe event and when do we use observe? Um, sorry, I took you. So, um, all right, uh, so the difference between observe event and observe. So observe event is specifically when you want to observe for a specific event and observe you can have multiple different uh, reactive values that are being observed together so the observe event mainly would uh, use it if you want to observe the event for some sort of specific input and see how it is uh, changes with uh, different inputs uh, there aren't any strict requirements and you can get a better idea on the master in shiny book as well where observe event and observe works best um, i tend to use observed um, i tend to use observe if there is uh, a not a specific uh, input, um, it's not a specific input, but a reactive value that I want to observe and observe event, I keep it normally for inputs that I want to observe specifically. Okay, do we have any question? Okay, thank you, Hedia. Thank you for that question. Okay. Do we have any question again? Okay. Okay. I think um, the time is well spent. So um, still have so much time on our hand here. So if we don't have any question, I think we want to give the vote of thanks to all our participants. Uh, we appreciate you. So I want to thank um, so much so many people, all our participants from locally, then we have so many people joining up from all around the world, from Spain, Mexico, India, um, okay, so we have from Tunisia, so um, we are grateful to all of you for joining us, and we want to give a very special thanks to Denise, we're really grateful for your time here. And it was really insightful for all 
the presentation. So it's so simple. The illustrations were wonderful. So we thank you so much. So we, I want to recognize all our local participants, Hidia, Sam Reed. Uh, there are so many people here. So much, everybody. Thank you, Matthew. So we appreciate all of you. So Janice, we're grateful and we look forward to having you some other time. I hope you would have liked our invitation. Yes, of course. And thank you so much for organizing this event as well. And thank you for all of the uh, participants as well. I know it's quite hectic coming straight after work into an even more uh, probably intense uh, workshop as well. So thank you so much for spending your time to come here as well. And thank you, Stephen and the Abuja uh, our user group as well for inviting me to this. Thank you so much. So on these notes, we're going to say a big thank you and that will be a goodbye from us. So the videos, every, the scripts, all are going to be shared after the webinar. So thank you so much and say bye from me and all our local participants here. Thank you. Bye, see you. Good evening. Okay.